Welcome back, boils and ghouls. Remember, if you enjoy these videos, hit that like button, get in the comment section below, and let me know. Think about sharing these videos with your friends, and if you really enjoy what you see, make sure you Hulk smash that subscribe button. If you feel like you're in a position to help the channel grow, think about using the link in the description below to sign up for my Patreon page for tons of behind the scenes posts, exclusive content, and even a personal shout out on the channel. If you want to help out the channel with Patreon is not your thing, there's links to jerk comic shirts and tons of other merch in the description below as well. But now it's time for another exciting episode of Page Turners. These videos are designed to showcase some of my favorite single issues of all time, which you can pull out of back issue bins for basically cover price or less, and give you all some context and behind the scenes information on what I think are some of the best comics ever released. The spec boom in the 90s was over. Sales were in a slump so bad that Marvel and DC began resorting to any methods that they could conceive of to boost sales, and none of it worked. In the aftermath of the collector's market of the 1990s, Marvel limped on with little hope of surviving the next decade. Then they revolutionized their comic universe and boosted sales with one of the oldest, saddest, tiredest routines in the industry a reboot. But this wasn't just any reboot, this was THE reboot. The ultimate reboot. Join me as we discover little known behind the scenes facts about the creation and evolution of the Marvel Ultimate line, and we take a close look at perhaps the finest single issue to come out of the entire endeavor, Ultimate X-Men 41. It's not a key, it's not valuable, and it doesn't even really star the X-Men but it does happen to be one of the best single issues that I've ever read in my entire life, and I've read a lot of comics. Trust me, you are not gonna wanna miss this one. So kick back and relax as we examine one of my all-time favorite comics and take a journey through the creation and evolution of the Ultimate line while we do in a little video essay I like to call the Bendis Miter Than The Sword. You can just call me the Punisher, because I got puns all day, baby. Frank Hassel, the Punisher. By 2000, the sales spec bubble had burst from the 90s, and comics, from then at least, weren't worth anything, contrary to what everyone had been told. Sales were in a slump, and Brian Michael Bendis was hired to start the Ultimate line in hopes of kickstarting sales, but people really didn't know where to start or what to try. Comics had gone from a billion dollar a year industry in 1993 to a quarter of that by 2000. Marvel had already declared Chapter 11 bankruptcy, and Bendis has said in quotes that he thought he was writing one of, if not the last Marvel comics. Now, this is a song and dance I've heard before, though. Every time the industry gets this shaken up, they have to do something drastic. Think outside of the box, and they have to do something original. This is not easy for the comic industry, and it inevitably leads to a wave of imitators and clones that will oversaturate that particular market and kill that demographic eventually, but that's been the case since the very beginning. Comic strip reprints got replaced by funny animal books, which got replaced by pulp, and then hero stuff, which then fell out of favor for the EC and other horror and sci-fi books in the 1950s, before then giving way to the Marvel era of the 60s, and Shooter rescued Marvel in the 80s, thinking outside of the box and really shaking things up for a lot of their major characters, and in every one of these junctures, people said, this is it. Comics are dead. But as long as we keep buying new books as readers, they'll keep putting them out. There might not always be like 50 Spider-Man titles a month, but at this point, I'm not entirely sure that's a bad thing. A big problem with the 90s, yes, the speculators bus was terrible, but one of the major problems that comics were beginning to face was the very thing that had made them different and special only a short time before. Continuity. 
40 and in some cases 60 years of continuity were beginning to be not so much these wonderful treasure troves of ideas and concepts to mine for future stories, but millstones around the creative team's necks. As writers and editors tried to find new ways of exploiting older, more obscure stories, you got stuff like the Clone Saga, and it wasn't long before Marvel was declaring Chapter 11 bankruptcy as a direct result. I mean, who would have guessed that telling fans that the Spider-Man they'd been reading for almost 40 years wasn't the real Spider-Man, but a mentally unstable clone who super slapped his pregnant wife so hard that Hank Pym told him to chill out would upset fans. Sorry. Sorry. So, just prior to rehashing old stories like the Clone Saga, there had been a nasty spate of horribly needless reimaginings of characters as well, like the Thunderstrike version of Thor and the offensively bad Daredevil armor. It was a dark time, and not like in the 80s dark when people were totally hell-bent on ripping off Watchmen and Dark Knight and turning every superhero into a slobbering psychopathic anti-hero, crushing skulls and hemorrhaging their way to victory on bloody stumps. Sales were so low, and Marvel was in such dire financial straits that with no one stepping up to the plate, it really did seem that Marvel might be going the way of the dinosaur. But then, in 2000, Marvel hired Bill Jameis to reinvigorate things. And here's two things I basically guarantee that you did not know about the Ultimate line of books from Marvel. Number one, Bill Jameis is the guy that started the line. Now wait for it. Jameis has a law degree from Harvard, but that's not why Marvel hired him. They hired him based on his previous work experience. That work experience, you ask? Why, he was the president of FLIR, of course. Jameis had quit his job as a lawyer after only two years to start working with the NBA, where he began to license cards. Eventually, Jameis turned that cottage industry into a multi-million dollar affair, which is how he landed his job with FLIR. Now, if you don't know, Marvel own Fleer at this time, and this is how we got all those crazy, awesome Marvel sets from Fleer, but this is also how they knew Jameis. Feeling that they had little left to lose, I think, Marvel promoted the ambitious Jameis during the corporate restructuring that took place following the Chapter 11 bankruptcy. The second and perhaps the most shocking thing is that the Ultimate line was started on suggestion from none other than Garib Shameless of Wizard Magazine, uh, sorry, Garib Shameless of Wizard Magazine fame. Seamus suggested to Jameis that Marvel do teenage versions of their characters, and Jameis took the idea and ran with it. In fact, I get the feeling that's basically the entirety of the pitch for Ultimate that Jameis would give Brian Michael Bendis and Howard Mackey that turned them off so much. It seemed like a more logical thing to start Peter Parker off as a teenager again, much of his cast still revolved around old classmates, and school had always played pretty heavily into Spider-Man's ethos, but one of the things that had made the X-Men so interesting over the years, and specifically the Claremont years, is the fact that they had, in essence, aged, and more importantly, they had grown as characters. They were far from the starry-eyed teens that they had been when they first joined Xavier's group of, like, radical teenage militants for mutant rights. This had become such an issue that numerous titles like uh, New Mutants and X Factor were launched to try and address it over the years, jettisoning the entirety of Chris Claremont's work on the X-Men was a risky move, and it seems that more than a few people were a little bit hesitant at the idea. Like the X-Men, the Ultimate line grew and evolved from this single, rather simple suggestion to simply start over. It was kind of a cop-out, and if it had been executed poorly, well, 
I think we all remember Heroes Were Born, and you can take your pick on that one for anyone in the know about that joke. And the ultimate line did not start off on what I would call solid ground. You can tell Jameis was super out of touch with the youth culture, and everything about the origins of the ultimate line sounds super hokey when you read about it. Originally, I guess... They were going to call it the Ground Zero Line, which is just awful. With the kinds of images that conjures the mind, I can only begin to imagine the pitch that Jameis delivered to try and get Brian Michael Bendis and Howard Mackey on board with Ultimate X-Men originally. But Jameis had always had a rather tenuous relationship with talent anyways, so enter his right-hand man and the guy who is really responsible for recruiting the younger wave of talent that would be needed to ensure the ultimate line wasn't a complete joke and outdated before it even launched, Joe Cusada. Cusada is loved and hated by comics fans, but during their time at Marvel, even after their toxic relationship turned into a complete public dumpster fire with the two contradicting and taking vindictive pot shots at one another by various media outlets, Kusada and Janus managed to release the Marvel Max line, which allowed Enos to really run with his genius reimaginings of the Punisher. Seen it, the Marvel Knights line, breathing new life into Daredevil for probably the first time since Frank Miller worked on the title in the 80s, and most important to many people of my generation and those that came before us, Cusada and Jameis were the ones responsible for finally getting rid of the Comics Code seal, which had haunted covers for decades. This is to say that while they might have relied a little too much on fireworks, Cusada and Jameis, much like Jim Shooter before them, rescued Marvel Comics from the brink of financial disaster and dragged the company kicking and screaming into the modern day, reviving long-dead properties and reinvigorating interest in other flagship properties suffering from waning sales. When Janus finally did get the Ultimate Lion started, it did not start with the bang that I think everyone remembers today. Ultimate Spider-Man sold a measly 54,000 some odd copies. Now today that number isn't terrible, but even just 20 years ago, those numbers were not gangbusters. And here's another cool little bit of trivia, and I'm not sure people remember. It's a kind of third fact about the Ultimate Line. The success of the Ultimate Line did not come from the direct market. Jameis loved Ultimate Spider-Man. He really thought that Bendis, who Kusada had found doing an independent comic and doing characters on the side to make ends meet, had done something special. Jameis and Kusada referred to the script as being almost like a movie or television script. It was so detailed. It was evident from the very beginning to both of them that Bendis had really hit on something. He hadn't just re-scripted or tried to rework the first issue of Spider-Man, and he really hadn't tried to be overly hip for the most part either. The series instead relied on the heart and soul of the Spider-Man character. Heart and soul. The character, the emotion, like the drama. So Jameis did something special as well for Ultimate Spider-Man. He distributed millions of copies to major chains and outlets like Walmart and apparently Payless Shoes of all places. The gamble paid off, and in a matter of months, the media was all over the new series, and readers could not get enough. Marvel quickly went into production on several other titles, and Ultimate X-Men by Mark Miller debuted in December of the same year, selling just about double the copies of Ultimate Spider-Man with an impressive 117,000 copies. Now, originally, Ultimate Spider-Man and Ultimate X-Men were going to launch either simultaneously or just following one another, but... Ultimate X-Men had been rather beset by delay after delay, which 
funnily enough, all stemmed from basically the same place. Janice and Cusada couldn't find or agree on a writer for the series, and the writers that they did approach didn't want anything to do with it. Initially, Ultimate X-Men was offered to Brian Michael Bendis, who was going to be writing the Ultimate Spider-Man book as well anyway. According to some accounts, Bendis didn't like the pitch, and he just passed on the project so he could concentrate on Ultimate Spider-Man. However, when I was poking around, it turns out that it's also very probable that Bendis, who was coming straight off of a pretty low income situation, hustling and doing crap work to make ends meet, actually submitted a spec script for Ultimate X-Men, which was turned down by Marvel. I'm not entirely sure which account is true. My best guess is that when Jameis originally pitched Bendis the X-Men title, he hated the pitch. Because he was essentially told, you want to do a teenage X-Men? And since Jameson Cusada had been so taken with his Spider-Man script, he probably went off and banged out a spec script, unsuccessfully hoping to sell them on his own idea. Either way, Bendis turned down the initial offer, and it turns out that Bendis isn't the only one who turned them down either, as I mentioned. In fact, Howard Mackey had been approached about the series as well, and Mackie says in interviews that he doesn't think the title even had an editor yet, which means that Jameis likely talked to Mackie himself before he even began using Cusada as his kind of emissary and mouthpiece. Cusada had something of a game plan for X-Men, but from what I can tell, Teenage X-Men is about the entirety of the pitch that Jameis was attempting to employ. Mackie was offered the job because of his success on the just-released Astonishing X-Men miniseries that had come out, I believe, the year prior, and might actually have been Marvel's first choice for the series. Thankfully, Mackie turned down Ultimate X-Men, apparently because he too thought the pitch was complete crap. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't mean thankfully because I think it would have been bad. I just think that the Ultimate Universe really did need some new blood, and that was not going to come from an industry veteran like Howard Mackey, no matter how successful his last X-Men series had been. Instead, they brought in Mark Miller, and with the exceptions of the terrible costume and character designs by Hubert, the series really was pretty decent. And do not try telling me that Wolverine and Cyclops' goatees don't make you just want to slap them. Honestly, I was never very interested in the Ultimate Universe. While I enjoy new stuff, I just wasn't interested in new takes on these old characters. I've seen that a million times before, and while it might have been a headache and sometimes a hindrance to intelligent storytelling, admittedly, I love all of the crazy history that these characters have accrued over their decades of existence and publication. I was even hesitant about Ultimate Spider-Man in the beginning, but luckily the local store owner lent me the first half dozen issues or so, and I was won over. By the time I finished them, Bendis did manage to completely sell me on Spider-Man, and I was down for the ride. Ultimate Spider-Man never felt like a rehash or someone trying to not do what Ditko or Lee or Ramita or Andrew or Severin or whoever did or would have done. Bendis was all about character-driven stories, and I like that, and obviously had a plan for Peter when he set out with the series, and they were all his own. I appreciated the subtle nods to fans of the older books, but also that Bendis felt free to kind of do his own thing and make the title his. I never quite felt the same about Miller's run on Ultimate X-Men, though, and so when I found out that Bendis, who was insanely busy at the time, had done a run on the title, I knew I had to check it out. In interviews where he's asked about what he had planned and why he chose to do the series at that point, rather than originally, 
Bendis talks about how he didn't like or understand the original pitch, but now that Miller has done all the hard work in like creating this universe with a kind of set of rules and a way that things worked, he could come in and do what he does best, which is tell stories about characters. Bendis talked about how he was going to make his stories exciting and an action-packed, but that this would be secondary to the characters and how they interacted, not just in the sense of the X-Men being a team book, but that he wanted to look a little bit less at the politics that Miller had been pushing so hard and explore the core of what he thought the X-Men were about, which was the characters. When he first announced working on the book, he was only going to be doing a six-issue arc titled Blockbuster. Once he started working on the book, I think he kind of fell in love with it, though. He was doing the book with David Finch, who was really at the top of his game in a lot of ways at this point. And Bendis quickly announced that he wasn't just doing six issues anymore. He was going to stick around on the series for an entire year with Finch. And not just that, they were going to do all 12 issues together. No fill-in artists, no interruptions, just pure Bendis, Finch, Ultimate, X-Men. Once the originally planned six-part blockbuster story arc wrapped up, they started the New Mutants story arc. New Mutants was also going to be a six-part arc and would involve reintroducing many of the characters from the original X-Men titles and integrating them with the Ultimate Universe. This would not only expand the roster of people for future writers and artists to play with, but it would allow Bendis to do what he wanted to do with the series, tell character-driven stories. The first issue introduces Warren Worthington III, better known as Angel or Archangel, to the Ultimate Universe in issue 40, as well as picketers that show up at the mansion strongly reinforcing the notion that people in the Marvel Universe are keenly aware of mutants and they are most definitely still a hotbed issue. But the way it's introduced isn't necessarily very clever or very effective. The issue falls pretty flat, but there's a continuing series of issues and events that keep popping up throughout Bendis' run. Like, Mutants not being able to control their powers. The sense of loss of control is very strong. And the world essentially being horrified and hating mutants is the other. Not that these are necessarily new to the X-Men. It's just that these were very heavily pushed by Bendis. And the second issue in his New Mutants arc comes out of almost absolutely nowhere. It is a kind of a psychological gut punch, the likes of which I have rarely encountered in my decades of reading comics. I will say that without a doubt that this issue is on a short list of about 10 comics, which I think are the most intelligent, insightful, and emotionally effective single issues of comics written in decades. It's the kind of comic book that you can basically hand to almost anyone, and they can read it and take away something from it. Maybe even a greater understanding and respect for comics. That's how good this issue is. In issue 40, where Angel is introduced, Rogue goes off on this, like, tangent about how he looks like an angel and Nightcrawler looks like the devil and there has to be greater religious ramifications to things than they understand or are willing to admit. She raises the question of religion and Beast posts it to the internet and there's this huge group of doomsday preppers and religious fanatics who show up at the mansion and it's this whole big thing. There's throngs of people everywhere, and the panels are packed with students. It's visually large and very loud. Then issue 41 opens on this empty house. There's a seemingly random teenager waking up, and he's doing the home alone routine. He wakes up, but there isn't anyone there, and he goes downstairs, and he's calling for his parents and his sister, and he even finds a pile of clothes on the floor in the shape of a human form, but there's no one there. 
and he eats breakfast and then he heads out for school and he doesn't see anyone for a while while he's headed to school either and he's kind of wandering through what appears to be a ghost town. The art by David Fincher is one of the things that makes this such an effective issue. You're sucked into the scene as he's walking along. Finch is really wonderful at these tiny, luscious details, these wonderful backgrounds, and this incredibly immersive scenery. And so you really feel like you're almost watching a short film as this kid is walking down these empty sidewalks and looking at streets with no cars and no people. Finally, as he passes his intersection, he sees some people driving their cars and he's super relieved because he was starting to get that whole home alone, it's a wonderful life feeling where something was just off. As he walks away from the cars and heads to school, we see them collide with each other in the background of the panel for no apparent reason. There's no one getting out of the cars though and no one honking or yelling. That's another cool thing. We're looking at this kid. He's absolutely the focal point of these panels. And in the background, there's these super important pieces of information. There's this incredibly detailed story happening in the background. Bendis had obviously learned that he could utilize Finch's ability to design and lay out scenery and backgrounds to tell a much more visually cinematic story in a lot of ways, and issue 41 shows that off incredibly effectively. Another way you can tell this issue isn't just special to me, I think, is the fact it has no title. There's no credits. There's no big splash page setting stuff up with brightly colored, ballooned up lettering to catch your eye. We are dropped straight into a scene and things just keep moving almost in one continuous scene in a sense until the halfway point of this comic. If it were a short film, I get the feeling it might be an almost continuous shot short film until the middle of the book. This issue is not a widescreen comic, though, but when Kusada and Jameis were asked why they hired Brian Michael Bendis for the Ultimate Spider-Man title after so many disagreements about who was going to write it, as I said, they said it was because of his quote-unquote television-like script. Bendis, I think, just writes stuff up extremely detailed, kind of like Alan Moore, like a movie or a television script because that's how he sees it in his head. And by this point, he'd been working with Finch for months. And this issue feels like Bendis simply taking the opportunity to tell this story almost because he can. Because Finch is good enough at telling a story visually. Bendis feels comfortable not blanketing the pages in dialogue. And in a lot of ways, it's almost like he had to tell this story. It it does not fall in line right after the last issue or even the last seven issues. It's not like, oh yeah, okay, now we're going to meet this new guy. And then, no, this issue is a standalone issue. It works completely on its own. And I think it says more about the entire X-Men universe than the entirety of the rest of the Ultimate X-Men title can bind. Although, to be fair, it does thematically tie into the continued ideas of loss of power and the general public's negative perceptions of mutants. So, it's not ignoring things, but it stands almost perfectly on its own. So, this kid is walking to school, and we see this car wreck but he doesn't. And he's just walking along, and when he gets to school, his girlfriend is super pissed off because apparently he didn't call her back because he wasn't allowed, he's not allowed to use his cell phone after 10 o'clock at night. He can't figure out why it's so important, and she says it's because she needed to talk to him about something important, and you can tell it's this comic setup where she's going to be like, so-and-so is missing or dead or such-and-such -such happened, and nope. Bam! Instead, her eyes get all wide with, like, horror, and she just says, 
it's you and everyone in the schoolyard is melting and evaporating and turning into dust and ash. It's insane. They look like the vampires from Blade or something. And this kid, who I think quite cleverly, Bendis never gives a name, is just standing in the middle of the schoolyard full of smoldering corpses as his girlfriend falls onto him and then toasts like everyone else. He has this look of utter shock and horror as he's trying to figure out what's going on. And we cut directly from this to the opening to a cave in the side of a mountain. This cut feels super important for two reasons. One, the entirety of the first half, or essentially the first scene, takes place during the bright, warm colors of the day. When we see the mountain, it's night, and there's this cool, dark, moody, monochromatic color palette, and you can immediately sense this contemplative change in the aesthetic and feel of the entire piece. The mountain is haloed in this dark night sky, but it's relatively warmly lit, and the entrance, while dark, doesn't look dangerous and forbidding or anything. Wolverine is walking into the opening of the cave, holding a match backlit by stars. When he gets to where the cave opens up into a cavern, there's this little collection of food and trash, and he hears this voice telling him to go away and leave, otherwise he will die. Wolverine uses the match to light a fire in the cave, and he explains to this kid that he can't die. He explains that he has this healing factor that basically keeps him alive no matter what, but it's working overtime while he's in the cave. It turns out the kid hit puberty the night before the story starts, and that's classically been when a mutant's powers fully manifest. So it turns out that this is the case, and this poor kid radiates toxins and acids now overnight. He's basically mutated to be the perfect killing machine, and essentially nothing organic can survive being around him anymore. So Wolverine explains what mutants are, and that this is his mutant power, and that he's responsible for killing something like 265 people, maybe more, including his parents and his sister and his girlfriend. It's dark, but it's not like needlessly gritty and hopeless dark. I didn't feel like I was reading something written in the shadow of Watchmen here, if that makes sense. And when you get into any sort of intellectual area of taking powers really seriously and analyzing and deconstructing them, it is super easy to fall into that modality of thought. So kudos to Bendis for that. In one page, one single page. This kid figures out what mutants are and that this is his power and that he killed all these people that he loved and knew and that nothing will ever be able to survive even being around him anymore. And he's like, nope, this is too much. I can't live like this. And you're expecting this big rousing speech and Wolverine to come back with something to counteract all this darkness and heavy stuff you've seen, and he totally does not. All he says is, I know. And, like, if you've read comics long enough, things totally click at this point, and you know why Wolverine is there, and it's not because of his mutant healing factor. Wolverine is drinking this beer, and he hands one to this kid, and that's another thing that makes this story work. You almost feel like you're kind of breaking the rules with this X-Men giving a high school kid a beer. And it's not Bendis being like, oh yeah, no, these aren't your parents' X-Men. They're edgy and they drink. It feels very organic and like a human decision that Logan would have made. And that's what he introduces himself as, by the way. He does not tell the kid his name is Wolverine. He tells him his name is Logan, which is a small touch, admittedly, but I thought it added a lot to the story. So Wolverine hands this kid a beer, and the kid is like, I should have done more with my life, huh? And he tells him he's a virgin, and he kind of starts to come apart a little, and he's like, 
I should have never been born. And he's getting kind of self-loathing, and Wolverine tells him not to worry. That no one will ever know that he did this. And this kid is like, he's a high school teenager. And he's outraged and shocked. And he's like, tell everyone that I did this. This kid is grappling with taking responsibility for his actions, even though they were completely involuntary. And this speaks to the core of what the X-Men have always really been about. It also ties back into a few things that were taking place in the series at the time, but honestly, this issue says just about as much about any era or version of the X-Men as it does about the Ultimate Universe for me. There are these seemingly normal people given extraordinary powers, and then treated extraordinarily bad by the world around them, but they always kind of manage to rise above that and morally prove themselves superior for the most part. It's an old idea and concept, but I'm not sure I've ever seen it so effectively conveyed in a single issue before. At this point, Not only has this kid basically already admitted that he can't live like this because he doesn't want to hurt anyone, but it's evident he wants the world to know what happened so that people can get whatever closure that they can and move on. And Wolverine is like, nope, not going to happen. And I remember when I was reading this for the first time, I was like, wait a minute, what? And here is the super dark twist that you basically do not see coming. Wolverine's like, see, if the world ever found out that a mutant was this dangerous, that a single mutant killed an entire town of people overnight by accident because he hit puberty, that would be it. They would hunt us down, they would round us up, And that would be the end of everything. And he says there's a, quote, big picture thing going on here. You think of Wolverine as the one X-Man who is okay with killing. And he has these knives coming out of his hands. And he's been brainwashed and trained to be the perfect killing machine. He's this perfect feral berserker killing machine because of his particular mutations as well just like this kid is a perfect killing machine because of his mutation. But as this kid is wrestling with the implication of who he is and what he's done, Wolverine is essentially trying to rationalize murdering, or at the very least, killing a high school kid for the greater good. Wolverine has always been the one X-Man who, while he constantly questions Xavier's dreams and his methods, has proven time and time again to perhaps be just as zealous about them as Xavier is in most cases, I think at the core of his character, Wolverine almost needs the X-Men to work, because if Xavier's dream is crap, then his entire existence is without meaning, and all of his suffering has been for nothing. Wolverine is on a constant road to self-redemption for events that in many continuities he's not even fully aware of, but even Cyclops wouldn't off a kid for Chuck and the greater good of mutant kind. Wolverine would, though, because of this. Wolverine would find some way to rationalize it and make that fit into his worldview. And that's the beauty of this comic. It works. It's not out of character, and it doesn't feel forced or strange or weird. David Finch's incredibly expressive art pulls you into the story and makes you feel like you almost know this poor random teenage kid, too. You definitely know how he's feeling and kind of what he's thinking. Again, to Bendis and Finch's credit, not because of excessive dialogue or even thought bubbles. Another comic trope that isn't utilized in a single panel of this issue, but because of facial expressions. 
Another super interesting thing that I picked up on is the fact that this conversation is composed of basically tight headshot panels as the two exchange dialogue. Wolverine has a dark night sky background behind him, but the kid has nothing but an inky black void. It's a small, subtle thing, but it's that kind of attention to detail, I think, that makes this such an incredibly amazing comic. So the kid is talking to Wolverine, and he asks him if a single chromosome had moved, could he have been an X-Men or something? But instead of answering him, Wolverine just tells him to finish his beer. And you can see the defeat and the sadness, and the kid just says, just do it. It's a wonderfully understated moment, and not having any clunky or stupid dialogue is one of the things that makes this work so well. We pull out of the opening to the cave now in the daytime, and we get almost an entire page of just a hollow, cavernous opening to this place of sadness and tragedy and then Wolverine appears, stoically looking into the distance, the sun kind of repelled by the darkness of, the, of his long hair and scruffy five o'clock shadow, but it doesn't come off cheesy or contrived. Really, this is one of the best single issues I've ever read. I cannot tell you how many times I've just cracked this open and thumbed through it. You don't need to know anything about anyone in the story to enjoy it other than maybe i guess having a general understanding of wolverine but i think that more than anything he kind of feels like a soldier in this story he's not there to exact revenge or anything he's there to go and kill this kid whose mutant abilities just accidentally wiped out a good section of a small rural town i think that people who are even just familiar with the concept of mutants, would be able to appreciate the level of thought that appears to have gone into this issue, that honestly, you probably don't even need that, because Bendis has Wolverine basically explain what mutants are in the Marvel Universe in a single page. This issue is so well written, it's crazy. But that's the end of the issue, that's the end of my rant about the ultimate line, so let's hop up from the table, I have a few parting words, and then we'll get out of here. Thanks so much for sticking with me, I hope you enjoyed, maybe even learned something, this really is one of my all-time favorite comics. If you did like what you saw, make sure you hit that like button, think about getting in the comments section below and letting me know, share these videos with your friends, and if you really enjoyed what you saw, make sure you Hulk smash that subscribe button. If you do that, ding the little notification bell so you never miss another video or premiere here again. If you feel like you're in a position to help out the channel, please think about using the link in the description below to sign up for my Patreon page. There's a myriad of exclusive behind the scenes information, video updates, and even content you can't find anywhere else. If you want to support the channel but Patreon is not your thing, think about using the links in the description below to pick up jerk comic shirts as well as tons of other merch. Thanks to everyone who's already picked something up or signed up for the Patreon page. It means the world to me, and I cannot thank you enough. Speaking of which, this episode was brought to you by the Jerk Broadcasting Corporation and generous grants from the patrons you see on the screen now. I'd like to personally thank my loyal Wednesday warriors, Mike Dolan, David Arroyo, and the Super Chasen. I couldn't do these videos without your help, guys, and I super appreciate it. If you want your name in the credits or even a personal shout out, check out my Patreon page for details, link in the description below. Thanks again for sticking with me. I hope you enjoyed, maybe even learned something. And as always, I really truly and honestly ask only two things. Keep hitting those local shops, keep reading comics.